Um, Sarah talks about the need to add funding, and with the best will in the world, we're never going to have the amount of funding that we would ideally love to add. Nobody is ever going to be in that position because unfortunately government is about allocating scarce resources and at the moment they are pretty scarce. And um, the Minister talks about the, um, the fact that councils are vacating the area of providing childcare and we can plead with them as much as we like but we can't stop the reality. The reality on the ground is that that's what they are doing. I hear from almost a new one every week and the reason they are is because they're going out of the door backwards. Not because they're not making money but because they're losing money. I had uh, Bayside councils from Melbourne come to see me most recently. They said, we're happy to break even, more than happy to break even, but we can't lose money because in two years' time, you know, we're simply going to be draining the ratepayers dry. So um, we have to deal with the reality on the ground and we have to recognise that with the cost price squeeze that a lot of centres are facing, particularly in our city areas, that childcare is not a model of council or business or community activity that is able to be sustained. So we have to get it back on a sustainable footing. And in order to do that, we have to recognise where the pressures are and try to ease the squeeze. And that's one of the things that I'm certainly saying, try to find ways where, for example, I mean, I'll, I'll just give one example. If you uh, have to bring in a, um, uh, a certificate three educator over your lunch break for three hours, in order to meet your ratios, that person might have to be a diploma educated person. It might be hard in a rural and regional area to find somebody who's going to work with that level of qualification for three hours a day. Maybe we could say that that three hour lunch break or early finishing period or someone going home sick period could be covered not by, um, well in Sydney you could pick up the phone and, and get a locum person in even though it's costly, you can actually find them in rural areas, you can't find them at all. Maybe we could say that that doesn't have to be covered by a person of that qualification. And that's not something I'm proposing because we've been through all the whole COAC thing and uh, the way it would roll out. But I mean, that's just an idea when I talk about easing the pressures that centres face. I'm very committed to rural and regional centres. I'm particularly committed to the budget-based funding model. I know the Minister's doing a review of that. I've had quite a few of these services come to me anxious about the results of that review and whether it might ultimately mean they receive less money. Um, I'm very committed to mobiles. As a, um, a woman with three children under five on a farm, you know, with them all struggling at the dairy or the shimmy shed, I would have loved to have any sort of childcare um, and mobiles started to grow uh, after my children were too old to use them. So I really want to see mobiles. I had a really cranky um, Aboriginal woman come up to me in Alice Springs not that long ago and say, why aren't we in the NQF? Why are we out of scope? How insulting that we as a group uh, aren't considered to be able to be picked up in the national quality framework. So I know that that is going to happen at some point in the future, but I'm all about supporting that particular group into uh, a model of childcare that can empower them as a community and also train many of their young women at the same time. Susan, with all respect, um, over here. <laughs> Sorry, better Dad. With all respect, I, I guess um, I don't see how the difference between a diploma covering a lunchtime or a sick day and paying a cert three is really going to address the cost of a commercial rental. Um, and so I really think that, um, you know, the difference between $2 or $3 an hour um, once or twice a week is not going to actually address an issue around costing directly related to the running of a program. I think once upon a time there was operational funding that helped people run that program. So, so operational funding from, from where? From the government. Um, yes, there was. And I mean, in an ideal world, that funding would be on the table now, but it's not. So maybe my example doesn't add up to many dollars, although I do meet centres that say to cover this particular staff member, they would have somebody for the full day because it's impossible to pay somebody for three hours. And the biggest problem they face in the region there is you actually can't find that person at all. So, you know, you're technically operating in breach. You have to call up, you have to get away for the day and so on. All of this adds to the cost of regulation, the pressure on your centre, and maybe your willingness if you're a regional council to even do it in the first place and the results unfortunately are out there with the numbers as we all know of local governments that are vacated in the area. Look there's some local governments that are doing great work and I, I want to give one a particular plug that I visited not that long ago, Swan Hill. Uh, they're actually paying the family daycare startup grant themselves, the $1,500 
to any family in the area that wants to start family daycare and it's working a treat, it's doing good work. So a lot of our councils are really committed in, in regional areas. Bernadette, can I just add something and just have to refute one thing that um, Bernadette said about the Susan has said, and this is about priorities. Uh, we, everybody knows that uh, funding proper, high quality education services costs money. It costs money for the centres to do it without uh, extra support from the government. They've been doing it for three years and understand that it costs money. It is about government making a priority. Um, yes, there is, a, there is a budget handed down every year and there is always a hard decision made. What, what in that budget gets cut, what in that budget gets funded. And uh, I guess my, my plea is that if we're serious about the dividends that investing in early childhood education and care gives, in terms of education outcomes, in terms of health outcomes, in terms of employment outcomes, in terms of the taxes that these kids are gonna pay with a good education from the beginning down the end, we've got to look beyond yearly budget cycles and election cycles and start investing and prioritising our budgets up front. Any more comments from the panel? Sorry. Oh, I could comment, but I, I, I'm just conscious of the fact that we want to get some okay. comments from the audience. So we, we now have to... Chris, that was your second question, I think. We now have to hear the voice of the child. Sam, it's over to you. What a weight of responsibility, the voice of the child. Um, look, I have, I've cut my questions down and I'll, I'll try and keep this really brief because I'm sure there are lots of other people who want to ask a question, but one I can't help asking is, we know, everybody here would agree we want children thriving and learning in early childhood settings. Uh, and recent research by Colette Taylor and her team published in the Australian Journal of Early Childhood suggests we're middling at best by international comparisons on achieving that. We really can't kid ourselves that Australia is leading the way in this. We're not. We're, mid we're middle, possibly even below um, middle rankings in, compared to similar countries. How do we build data systems to measure outcomes for children that will inform decision making for the next decade? How do we build that into the Productivity Commission review so that outcomes for children are absolutely central? How do we build that into the review of the partnership agreement and the, the national quality agenda so that we start to turn the public discourse away from the... Pro I mean, the productivity agenda is important uh, and, it, and it will drive investment into this sector, but how do we get children's outcomes much more front and centre in that social discourse and in the decision making of future governments. Um, and, and how do we do that for disadvantaged children? And we all know who the groups of disadvantaged children are, the AEDI data being one source of that. But it's, it's still not winning the hearts and minds of the general public. It's still not convincing uh, the priority decisions that are made about the budget every year that this is such an important area of investment. And I do think we need the voices of children, but we also need clear outcomes we all agree on, they're understood, they're measured regularly, and, and they're available to all of us. I'm using my ministerial powers once more. Um, thank you, Sam. I think that's a great question. I think it's actually two separate questions. One question... Oh, yeah. Well, well I, I wish they were linked, but the question is how do we measure outcomes and how does that help then drive the public discourse? And Sadly, I think they are. There's there's a different answer to each of them, but measuring outcomes and one of the things which Julia Gillard was the absolute champion of when she was the minister for education um, was working with Frank Overclade and others to say we are going to introduce the Australian Early Development Index. We are going to do a census of four-year-olds across Australia, and then we're going to do something that governments often don't like to do, and that is we are going to publicly and transparently release the results of where children are falling behind and in what areas they're falling behind in. And I think that this is hugely important policy because it means that, one, we can then measure how we're tracking and what's having results and how we're improving outcomes. But two, we can see where, the, where to direct resources. Where is it that children are particularly vulnerable? Where is it that they're falling behind? And we can work across the federal government, state government and local government in saying, in this particular area, children have a real issue with literacy. So let's have a focus there. In this particular area, we know that there are physical vulnerabilities or whatever it may be. 
Um, so I think in terms of measuring outcomes, that is one of the most powerful tools that we've ever had when it comes to Australian children. And I think we are only just at the beginning of how we most appropriately use that information to get the best results. Um, so I think the AEDI is a really important way of measuring outcomes. I don't think it will do much to change the public discourse. I think, um, and I'm like many people here, um, I say whenever we announce funding for early childhood education, I'm the person that gets the emails saying, well, if people want to have kids, why can't they look after them themselves? Why do my taxpayer dollars have to go towards it? Um, like I see, you know, and people say don't read the comments on the online um, articles and the like. Well, I think in this regard you can see that. But we still do have a really long way to go in terms of changing attitudes and changing culture and moving away from... Well, in my day, we did it ourselves. We looked after them, you know, someone stayed home and looked after the children to actually moving it to these are the benefits, not just to those parents, not just to that child. These are the benefits to our society if we fund this properly. Two different answers, I think, Sam. Um, I think we do need to do a lot, a lot more with uh, the collection of data and, and research and um, the index is, is one way, but I also think we need to be properly funding our universities and research institutions to be able to do that. I think it's crucial. Um, a lot of the universities uh, who are trying to do this type of work find they only get to do it if there's something left over at the end of their, um, their budget. It's not put up there as a priority in terms of um, uh, grants, research grants that are coming through. I think we need to be working with our university sector uh, to change that. But you know, ultimately, um, I think this comes down to the fact that culturally, we, I don't think, let's face it, I don't think we value children in this country very well. Um, I think that's why we don't value early childhood education workers. I think it's why we um, don't have um, childcare as a priority on our budget and we get told that um, there's only this, we're gonna bring in reforms, but it's all gonna have to be paid for from the same bucket of money. Um, you know, it, it, just, it struck me, I, um, I took my daughter when she was uh, 18 months old to France and uh, travelling around with an 18 month old baby and we had you know, a backpack thing and, and we spent three weeks on the road. The truck stops in France, the baby change rooms in the truck stops were better than the baby change rooms at you know, a Westfield shopping centre in Sydney. And it's a valuing parenthood, children, and the, the idea that right from that point through to how we value their education, how we value their voice. And we've, we've made leaps and bounds in the last 12 months by finally having a National Children's Commissioner. And that's been on the uh, sector's agenda for 20 years. We signed a UN convention 20 years ago saying we'd do it. It took us 20 years to get there. So that's a good thing and that's a plus, but I think um, that's an indication that it is a cultural shift and it takes leadership from, from all sides, uh, not just from our politicians, but also from our media commentators and our universities as well. Sam, I, I think the good points have been made. I could just quickly add that Arasi and, uh, has developed a very good early assessment tool, as Emerson keeps me informed about that, of the indicators of children's need. It's evidence-based and it's linked to data collection, and it's really good. Oh, and the reference group. <laughs> Great. Good answer. <laughs> Sam, do you have another question? Or you no, have to I, no, I think, oh. I think oh. we should go to the floor. Okay. Yeah. Oh. I'd love to, love to, but I, I okay. can catch up with these lovely ladies. Okay, um, our first question. Can you stand up and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Ali, I'm from Tassie. I thought this was worth it. <laughs> to go on the yeah. 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 live in a very fairly regional area and I'm very aware that the issues faced in Sydney are vastly different to my local community. I'd like to know from each of you, if you create additional places, how do you propose to staff those without funding professional wages for educators? <coughs> I'm sorry. I think we should be funding professional wages for educators. I think that's precisely the point. And um, 
you can't, it's not just that you have to fund their wages, you have to fund the conditions and ensure that they are valued so that they don't leave the sector. And that in rural areas as much as anywhere else, um, particularly if there's no other options. If there's only one or two services in, in that area, you've got to make sure you've got the best qualified staff uh, working there, committed there, and working with the families. Uh, the uh, wages issue um, is something that I don't think any of us can shirk. And I don't think we can just leave it to Fair Work Australia and say, oh, well, when they decide what their award wage will be, we have to be committing to funding that wage increase. Um, if, um, if, if I were you and, and you were concerned about the wages, and if I was you, I would be, um, you would encourage United Voice to run the wage case to the Fair Work Commission, which they have, and you would be part of providing the evidence that your job has changed, that you are now required to do things that you didn't have to do before as a Certificate 3, that because your ability to interpret and put into practice and reflect on the National Quality Framework and Standards has changed your role, you should be paid more. And if you make that case really well, your wages will increase on a long-term sustainable basis. But I'd also say, because you're from Tassie, that I've been told that 60% of the um, childcare in Tasmania is being provided by family daycare. And we also have to look after that sector. Not at the expense of long daycare, because obviously they are complementary and some families use both. But because you're from Tasmania, I just want to mention that I was concerned at the numbers that are exiting family daycare on my last visit there. Fantastic. Well, I think we've we've both um, both speakers have established a pathway moving forward, and as I said, we're incredibly proud to have created the framework for that to be able to be brought forward. Um, so, whilst that process is being undertaken, I would just add that that's really important in terms of increasing wages moving forward, having a process by which people can can follow. But I'd mention one other thing. It's also important that we make sure that we have a system in place where people are getting paid what they're entitled to right now. And I think it's really important that as a government that we have funded um, not just Fair Work Australia, but Fair Work Ombudsman who can make sure that people are getting what they deserve to get. And we may have seen there was an announcement just last week about the fact that they are doing a special audit and inquiry in this sector as a result of how many early childhood professionals have been underpaid in recent times. Clamping down on that is step one. Moving to increase wages is definitely step two. Uh, thank you. Can we'd you please like sit down? Because we'd like to open We'd like the all sector to be gender parity. So can we please remember that everybody is educated, not girls choosing a career path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Over here. Um, I first want to say congratulations. I'm an early childhood teacher. Um, <laughs> so we to say, yeah, yeah. Um, Congratulations on the NQF and the Being, Belonging, Becoming framework. Um, they're all about changing attitudes and changing culture. That's what they're about. The unfortunate thing is we are not meeting the United Nations rights of the child, so I guess I'm speaking for children here. And if we do look at it, we are going to have to, have to look at things on a situational basis and not have a full scheme and start helping people that need it most. How can we do that is a big question, but I think that um, we need to look at the being belonging and becoming um, and, and start changing our attitudes and our culture. Was there a question? That you oh, question, asked? sorry. How do you think we can do that? Uh, keep the NQF and work towards helping the children who most need it. The same question, but I think that's what we need to fall back on. And as politicians, <coughs> How do you think we can best do that? Um, th thank you for clarifying that, because I think it's really important that whilst we say we've got a learning framework, we're not saying that every child across Australia is going to sit down and play this game on this day and is going to learn about this the next day and is going to do that. It needs to be flexible, it needs to be a framework. Um, and it needs to be interpreted based on that child's needs. I think that's really important, but the other, I mean, the other part of your question is that those most vulnerable children, how do we offer them support? 
as we know, and I think we've probably discussed at one of these forums previously, we have in place the inclusion support program. Um, I've said that I think there is scope for reform of the way that that's delivered moving forward. Um, I think that we need to look at ways that we can ensure that centres are encouraged to um, take on children with additional needs and have the support to do that and do that well. And I think that that will be an ongoing debate which we will we'll probably touch on again in the future. Um, another question, anybody in the back of the room? Yes? I'll try to keep mine concise. Um, I'm a centre director and an early childhood teacher. Um, I, I guess I firstly want to say I think the Inky work has been a huge development in early childhood, a huge step forward in making sure that uh, making sure and advocating that children aren't just um, children. They are not to be seen and not heard. They have a voice in the community as much as an adult. Um, but I guess my thing is. Uh, the NQF is all about the importance of teachers and diplomas and 50% from now from next year has to be 50% of qualified workers in the service. So how are you facilitating or how, what can you do to facilitate this when the view of people coming out of university or workers in the workplace to get a teaching degree is not worth it because you're spending all this money to go to uni and you're not going to get it back because there's really no benefits to it. So. We've got an increase from the 1st of July, but from, the, from next year, it's going straight back downhill to where we started. So I guess my question is, how can you facilitate for this? And secondly, um, I think what I, I guess what I was going to say is, sorry, I can't see you speak, so I can only go by sound. Um, one of you said that, you know, Australia's view on early childhood isn't, um, I guess, as community-based or, some, sorry, I couldn't move down. As, um, as other countries in the world, I would challenge that just because Australia is so multicultural, we have so many cultures here. What gets forgotten is people come from these cultures overseas that are so community based, they lose that culture. So they don't understand what early childhood is about and early childhood education is about because they don't have that in their culture. So I can speak for my parents, they came off the boat, so to speak. Um, I'm the first generation here, I have no other family here, so I had no community base that had to completely set it up from scratch. So childcare for them was a foreign concept and a waste of time because purely on the basis of the fact that they never had that in their small village. So I guess early, early, early childhood centre is their own community in themselves. So trying to advocate to parents the importance of early childhood and how important it is is important to have diplomas and teachers to do that. So I think workers make up such a big part, they don't understand the concept of $20 million, $60 million into early childhood. They don't see how it affects them in their pocket at the end of the day. So I guess we want to see action, not just words. So what could you do to facilitate to getting qualified people into the service and retain them? Well, um, I think there's a range of things. One, I think that we can support people to take on those studies, and you would have seen a range of initiatives from our government, that $190 million odd in terms of um, fee wave support along the way. I think that's important, but I also think you're quite right that at the moment people go, well, yes, that might help me to get my qualification, but what happens after that? And we know, um, we know through the experiences, through the voices of educators, we also know through the Productivity Commission that wages is a key part of that. Um, there's no walking away from that. Um, and so that is really important. That is why um, whilst the Fair Work Australia course um, runs its course, we wanted to introduce the $300 million um, early years quality fund and think that that is an important step. Um, one, to show the sector that we recognise that there needs to be action in this area and that we do value you and the hard work that you do. So I think that's been a really important step forward as well. Um, but I think it is ultimately about securing long-term wage increases whilst also working to show that we value the sector and that we don't view you as babysitters. Yes. Hello, um, my name's Rob. I'm, I'm involved in the management of a, a group of childcare centres. Uh, picking up on our Tasmanian friend, which you mentioned, uh, gender parity. Um, 
We had that advertisement running continually for a full range of qualified people. Um, and I'd say in the last two years, I haven't had a male apply for a position. Um, we have a divorce rate or separation rate in this country that's over 40%. We've got young children, probably now right through to about 12 or 13 year old, who have a very little male influence um, on their education. Um, through their households, if there is a separation or divorce, uh, usually custody is with mum most of the time. Uh, so there's very little male influence at home. 50% of our population is male. Um, is there anything happening to try and attack, attract 50% of the population into the workforce of early childhood? Uh, and maybe let's focus on ECTs, diplomas and the like, and some balance in the education of young children, both boys and girls. I, I think that's a great idea and I think we should take that on notice. It's funny because in, as I said, I've been to about 200 centres in the last 12 months. Um, the ones in Queensland and WA tend to have many more blokes. Um, just an interesting thing I've always noticed, but they really do add value on the floor or in whatever capacity they are acting as educators. They're very, they're, 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 it's fantastic to see them and it would be good to try and encourage more. But look, the national take up of women in the traditional trades was something else that I'd like to see, given that um, that's my own background as being a woman in traditional male areas. Um, and it's extremely difficult to encourage I don't want to say the non-traditional gender, but that's exactly what it is, into an area and um, role models and ambassadors would be vital and they could really lead the way. But look, it's a great comment to take on notice. But I assume you're talking about males with diplomas and early childhood <coughs> degrees, just not males per se. Of course. Yeah. 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 Great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I don't think I don't think we're we're we would be having a bunch of our children in childcare workers being paid less than some of the cleaners in the centres if men were actually <laughs> as parents. Yeah. 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 I would also add that I absolutely agree with you on the importance of it. I think the importance of um, male role models in children's lives is incredibly significant. Um, I think that one of the things is to increase the standing of the early childhood workforce by showing the value, by moving a focus onto education um, and not this traditional feminised view of um, women look after babies because we're carers. That is not what the profession is about. And I think as we continue to increase the understanding of that, then we might see an increased take up. But it is like, I mean, as a, as a former Minister for the Status of Women, I did a lot of work on um, the reverse, on trying to encourage um, women to be able to have career pathways in science and engineering and in a range of other areas. It's incredibly hard to, to um, change some of those cultural barriers, but I think it is something that you chip away on and that you encourage people to get in the sector and you hold them up as role models when they do. Um, there's another saying that I, I used to say, then um, um, I really believe that people cannot be what they cannot see. People need role models and we need to hold up strong and great male early childhood educators as an example that other people can aspire to be. And I think when you see some of those success stories spread around, that will also encourage other people to take that part. Hi, I'm Megan. I'm a oh, mobile, oh, mobile service in the Central West. And I just wanted to raise the issue of universal access again, um, particularly around the market failure for rural and remote um, communities and children. Universal access, we've seen it on paper, but it doesn't actually seem to be happening in these rural and remote communities, particularly when the services that are there are mobile services and indig Indigenous services which are currently out of scope, currently operating under supplementary regs, currently can't be approved services, can't access CCB, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, you know the list. Um, I'm just wondering how we will be able to address that critical issue sooner rather than later. Um, on the issue of universal access and access to the universal access funding, I guess, 
um, I, I'm happy to, to take up that issue and have a look. As I said, this is something that um, has come back into my portfolio area, but I recognise that there are discrepancies in different states and territories in the way that it's being rolled out in the funding agreements, and so I'll, I'll take that one on board and see what more we can do on it. On the issue of out-of-scope services, and I know this is something that's come up a couple of times, and it's an issue that we've discussed many times, what we want to do is ensure that we increase the standard of care across the board and that everybody can, ac can have access to quality services. What we don't want to do is to bring services in which are, which are not going to reach the standard and are going to end up falling out. And so what we are doing is working... No, 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 no and I'm not saying that about your service, but what we were talking about, we were talking about budget-based funded services and the discussion we were having around that before. <laughs> What I don't want is to have a situation in Australia where we have one quality standard for the whole country and another standard for the most vulnerable and disadvantaged and remote children out there. I don't think that that is sustainable and I think that we need to work to ensure that everybody can come in scope. But my point is that we have to do that in a way that isn't going to disadvantage services along the way and that we have transition arrangements in place. And that is something which we need to look at um, the funding um, as well that will be required to to lift some of the services that need to be lifted, but I think it's got to be an absolute priority. I think that mobile services have been chronically underfunded and um, without putting too strong a point on it, ignored. I've uh, got lots in my electorate. I'm thinking of the one that leaves from Broken Hill and travels up some shocking dusty roads to Tibbaburra, around, back again, does another hunt out to White Cliffs and Will Canyon. And it's not always that the children are disadvantaged. Sometimes the children on farms are, are fine. They just don't actually have access to any early learning. And I think by sort of putting them out there on the edge in budget-based funding, which is now under review, um, it's not acknowledging that they should have exactly what everyone else has. And I think when it comes to universal access, the um, prescriptive nature that's been rolled out in many states, which says that it must be for um, this certain amount of hours every week, 15 hours, and you might, as a service, want to use it a bit differently, and you should be able to do that, because if a family's got a two-year-old and a four-year-old, um, or a three-year-old and a four-year-old, they should be able to use that funding to actually spread over um, uh, their own personal circumstances or their community circumstances. But um, the Minister said she's recently taken on this, and um, she may well have a look at it for you. The, the other thing I would just very quickly respond, if I could, okay. is that... Um, I, which I'll just point out because Susan has mentioned on two occasions that we are reviewing budget-based funded services um, and I don't know if there's an implication that that's a negative thing. Can I just say that if I was running a budget-based funded service, I would be pretty keen to have the funding of that review and I would be pretty keen to ensure that just because it's been funded at a certain level and in a certain way for not just years but decades that that carries on um, into the future. If we keep doing things in the same way, we will keep getting the same results and I don't want the same results. So I want to increase the standards so that we can bring the services into scope. Just over 7.30, do we have time for one more question? Yeah. I, I have to go. Have to go. Yeah. I have to go, but I have signed yeah. the pledge. <laughs> around three and four year degree teachers and academic institutions and what they do and don't do. So, Karina, I hope your question or your statement's about well, something around that. Straight out of that field there. Okay, okay. okay. Well, we we make we, it quick. We okay. Are they? Very quick. Okay, we've talked a lot about education and care. With um, years ago, primary school teachers were never paid as other support staff were never paid the same as high school teachers and so they got pay equity and then we started seeing more people come in. Can we see a move from education and care and into the education department where people will actually be recognised for the skills and the qualifications that they have? Because I think that's crucial in the end run. I mean, we education, early childhood education is set separately. If it could possibly move into mainstream, I think we'll, we'll see great advances there and I'd like to see what you people think about it and I'm no disrespect to you to you Kate of having your own portfolio I think that's a great idea but if we could actually be part of the education system I think that would be great. I think this 
comes exactly back to when we were talking about the big picture, when we were talking about if we were starting from scratch, what a system would look like. Um, but to be really honest with you, what we're looking at at the moment is the federal government funding um, our early childhood services, state governments funding and running schools, except for the private and the Catholic and independent schools, of course, which the federal government steps in on. Um, the short answer to your question is, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that that's likely to happen anytime soon, because it's, it's not. Um, I, I agree with you, if people were starting from scratch, that would probably be what it looked like. Um, but if the question is, um, are um, early childhood services and the funding of them likely to move into the state-based state education departments? And it's, but then it's that, not. Wasn't, that wasn't my question. Oh, it was okay. actually, my question was not where they're going to move into the state, but whether or not, rather than a separate portfolio in the oh, federal okay. ministry, if they're actually considered as part of the Department of Employment, Education and Workplace Relations, sure. if that's the new name of it, I can't remember what Bill Shorten's thing is. What, what's your view on that and would that actually ensure that professional rates of pay may start to be paid? Oh, for these people? Sorry, I entirely misunderstood your question. The answer to your question is that is where this sits at the moment. And we have a number of ministers and a number of ministries that sit within that same department. You know, a minister, yes, for education, a minister for early childhood, a minister uh, for workplace relations, a minister for employment, a minister for employment participation, just within the department. But it does mean that because they're located in the department, that there is information sharing. There are people that are working on the same things. And the person that is making the decisions in terms of school education is well briefed and well across what's happening in the early childhood space as well. And um, that's, I'm gonna stop talking about the bureaucracy and the, and the makeup of it, but it does work that way at the moment. And I think that's a good way. And that is the way that it should continue to work. Um, if we are going to move closer and closer and increase the focus on the education side and the education benefits, then that's exactly where it should sit and that's where it sits now. I'd like to um, close this evening by thanking uh, Minister Kate Ellis. Thank you. Um, I'm going to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Kate has signed her pledge as well. Sarah Hansen, Tony Goddard, Chris Legg, Sam Page, and Leanne Hibbs and the staff of Community Childcare for once again hosting us tonight. And thank you.